I just started coaching, which I absolutely love. It's, it's literally like one of the best things I've ever done. I wanted people to talk to because I just felt like I, my, my parents and my partner, Ben, is absolutely fantastic, but they just don't get it. And like, I felt like that's why I was, but when I was a teacher, I could relate to those children. So I, cause you can say, I get it. Cause I, you know, I've been through it and I, I wanted the same sort of people, but obviously because obviously the pandemic and obviously being in Asia, it's still not yet developed, you know, the SEM world kind of, it's not quite there yet. Um, there's nothing here really. So I just wanted to kind of create a, like a, just a small group that just met on zoom weekly. And it's just, there's, you know, we're just everyday people and we just, we just come on and we just talk about how the week's been and, you know, and if people can give strategies that help other people, then that's great. ADHD Rewired episode 352. This is the podcast for those of us with really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. I'm Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by training and a coach by design. I'm your host and I have ADHD. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community. We are wired for connection and you are not alone. Go to ADHDrewired.com to learn how you can join us in our free secret Facebook group. Get additional resources for every episode, including links to any resources we we mentioned on today's show. You can support us on Patreon, sign up for our email newsletter, you can request podcast postcards to distribute to your clients and support groups, and you can learn all about our intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. You can do all of this at our website, ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. Today's guest is Natasha Hickling. Natasha, is she is 28 years old and from the UK. She is traveling around the world for the last four years, working in Australia, China, and now Malaysia. She is a trained primary school teacher and is now a SENCO, which stands for Special Education Needs Coordinator, at an international school in, I am not going to pronounce this correctly, Kuala Lumpur. How did I do? Yeah, that's, that's okay. Kuala Lumpur, but yeah. <laughs> I got a, that's okay. Like, close enough. Yeah, um, close. She lives there with her partner, cat and dog. After years of struggle with... Uh, disabilities, diagnosis, uh, mental health disorders. She was finally diagnosed with ADHD uh, this year. Yeah. And uh, to help with this, she's started a small online support group that we will talk about. And because uh, she wants to help reach out to other people around the world to connect and share their experiences. So uh, we want to, I guess, talk about today, sort of the beginning of uh, your ADHD journey. Yeah, yeah. So thank you so much. So um, I I kind of like to start where I actually got diagnosed and then go back to my childhood. So I was diagnosed with ADHD uh, around eight months ago. And um, my doctor actually said to me, so this is the beginning of your ADHD journey. And I said, no, it's not. And he laughed and he said, why? You've just got diagnosed. And I said, well, I've been living with it my entire life. I just didn't know what it was called. You know, I just didn't have the identification of what it was. And um, he just laughed and he said, oh, that's a really funny way to look at it. And I said, well, you know, that's, you know, I've had to deal with everything my entire life. And you were diagnosed when you were in China. What was that like? Yeah, it was quite a, um, an interesting thing. I, um, I was diagnosed by a British um, psychiatrist um, when I went home. I went home for like a trip. And I was diagnosed there just because I wanted to do it in my home country to have that for when I go home. Mm -hmm. And uh, you said so this wasn't the sort of the beginning of your journey. So you did have uh, previous diagnoses. Yeah, that's right. I right, just so want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So um, when I was a child, I was kind of myself and I was very confident. I was a big tomboy. I knew who I was when I was before like the age of 10 and um I, my parents called me a whirlwind. I was an absolute whirlwind with my emotions. You know, I never stuck at anything. I was kind of strange. You know, I couldn't ride a bike, you know, all these different things. And my parents just called me a whirlwind. They, you know, I'd talk all the time and things like that. And then 
when I became a teenager, because of like the peer pressure, I, you know, I kind of became what I wanted other people that I thought they wanted me to be. And I found it really stressful because academics then started to get harder. And at school, I um, I was seen as this nice, pleasant, younger, very quiet. And my parents would actually come into my school and they would say, oh, so how's Natasha doing? The teacher would be like, great. She's so quiet. And my parents would be like, what? What? You're talking you about talking the same about kid. The same? Yeah, <laughs> literally. Because when I was at home, because I like at school, like I say it was like suppressing, like more of an inattentiveness. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously I didn't know that back then. But um, then when I was at home, like all my energy would come out and my uncontrollable of my emotions is something I've really always struggled with. And I was always in trouble with my siblings and things like that. So for my parents, they couldn't really understand. And I would struggle so much with my homework and things like that. But at school, because my parents, my mom's a teacher. So because she helped me so much at school, it was like, you know, I could kind of get away with it. And um, it got to the point where I just couldn't do it anymore. Um, and I, you know, I had to keep making excuses for myself. I was embarrassed. It just was too much. It became really unbearable. And it was like being two people was just too much. You know, I was being kind of myself at home and then this person at school, like this persona. When you came home, did you kind of fall apart? Yeah. I, it was, it was all right when I was a child. Cause when you're at like primary school, you can kind of be yourself a little bit more, can't you? Cause there's not so much peer pressure, but then when it got to like high school, it was just kind of like, I had to, because of the peer pressure and obviously you're getting older and the, the academic struggles that I had, it was kind of like then more of the hyperactiveness than would get pushed on at home. And it was really uncontrollable. And, I, you know, I actually apologized to my sisters quite recently and my mum and dad really? when I was diagnosed. Yeah, I was so sorry. And they were like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, I was so difficult. And they were like, yeah, but that's just you. And mm. I was like, oh, OK. <laughs> how, how was that received by you? Like that, that, just, that it seems like there was just a full just acceptance of of you. How, how was that for you? I always say that my parents embraced me and my family embraced me. And I think that's why I never really got picked up because they just kind of, they just saw me who I was and they just, well, basically my mom's an SEN teacher. So she couldn't believe that she'd never picked this up. You know, she deals with this every day at school and she just said she just loved me and they just worked harder and found ways to, you know, cope. But what was it that drove you to reach out to your your sisters then like to, to apologize? So I think it was just because like I I always um was a bit different with my sisters and I they they always said that I wasn't left out but I felt left out and they never tried to I just felt it because I was different than they were so it was kind of um like I just felt like I needed to to be able to move forward with my life now I felt like I you know especially in this quarantine time I felt like I needed to go back to then kind of relive everything you so you know speaking of the quarantine, I think that that if I if I when we first spoke, if I understood sort of the timeline, while in quarantine you ran a marathon for charity while in quarantine. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> bit of crazy. I'm a bit crazy like that. Um, right. So let's specify because it's not just during quarantine you, you ran out. Like while actually in quarantine. You ran a marathon. So we, we talk about that. <laughs> Let's do that. So um, I found um, I wasn't allowed. So in Malaysia, we weren't allowed outside for five weeks, not even to walk my dog. And it was really difficult. And I'm a runner. That's how I get my emotions and things out. That's what I do. And I was like, oh, my goodness. I'm, I like, was really struggling with my online job and things like that. And, um, and I saw a lot of my kids also struggling because obviously I work with SEN. And I was like, oh, my goodness, like, why not? I could run inside. Why not? So I just thought I would use it as a way to then raise money for an ADHD charity in the UK called Addis. They're a great play, the great charity. And I then decided to run 26.2 miles around a 31 meter loop. And I ended up running 1,074 loops of my house. 
<laughs> so here's a question. How did you keep track and not like lose your like the, the count? I would imagine you were actually somehow tracking because I would, I would be like, wait, what number am I on? <laughs> so like one ma- one mile was like 40 laps. So my partner would sit in the spare bedroom where I didn't run and I'd run past him and be like one. Oh my God. <laughs> he would keep like, he would do a tally chart because he, he filmed a lot of it. Then he would do like a tally chart. And then when I got to 40, it was like, okay, back to one, one, two. And I think that's what kept me going because I do that a lot with my ADHD management, you know, break it down into steps rather than, mm. oh my God, I've got 26 miles. Just doing one step at a time was the way I kind of got through it most of it <laughs> that's, that's brilliant so h- how much uh how much money did you end up raising so i raised uh just uh with gift aid about a th- over a thousand pounds for Addis. Uh, any any i have no idea what that means in, in american dollars um, um i have maybe like 13 1400 dollars oh wow wow yeah yeah wow i can't even imagine running a, a, <laughs> a marathon in a enclosed a 39th floor apartment <laughs> You ran a marathon. I don't think I'll do it again. So like people <laughs> said to me, like, you're crazy. And I was like, yeah. And then when it got to like four hours, I was like, oh my goodness, people were so right. Wow. <laughs> How long did it take you to do it? it? Took me five and a half hours. I mean, I'm not an expert on marathon times, but that's a pretty good time, isn't it? Yeah, it's not too bad. I, I, I've done a marathon before, but it, it's not too bad. But I, I just wanted to run the whole thing and just not stop. But by the last mile, I looked like an absolute, like, oh, I was so fatigued. My arms were up here and I was just so slow. It's, it's like you ran a marathon. <laughs> yeah, literally. <laughs> so when you were, when you were growing up, um, one of the things that you said that, uh, that was a really meaningful sort of experience in your life is that your, your sister would, would read to you. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Right? Talk a little bit about that. And there's specifically, there was a certain book that your sister would read to you. Yes. Yeah, so uh, when I got to my chief to see is I, um, I started to have a lot of obsessions and compulsions. What, what is it when, it when you got to your. Oh, GCSE. Sorry. That's an English term. So when I got to like 14 to 16, which are okay. the exams in the UK. Okay. Sorry, I always forget that GCSE is. Um, so I would, um, I got diagnosed with OCD. It was actually my sister that was like, Natasha, like, something's going on here. Let's get, you know, let's get tested and things like that. Because uh, my anxiety got overwhelmed at school and at home and I started to have panic attacks. And mm. how old is your sister? Uh, my sister's six years older than me. Okay. Okay. So she was about 20, 22, 23. Okay. And so you're having uh, panic attacks around this time. Yeah. And I started to have obsessions. So I, you know, I started to do, um, Things like turn the light off 10 times before I went to bed. It used to take me three hours to get into bed um, and things like that because it was just kind of like a way of coping with what was going on in the day and at night. And it was just a way of coping without being emotional, just being in my own head. I felt it was a way rather than being out. Mm. So I was diagnosed with OCD and anxiety and my sister, I started to feel really negative about it. It wasn't a positive thing. And my sister started to read the Indigo Children. And she was like, Natasha, this is you. Like, this is you. And it's, it's a book about children that are different. And, and, you know, it's not got a scientific or, you know, knowledge behind it. It's just like, it's not a story. It's, you know, it's a nonfiction book. But it's just like reasons behind all the, like, these types of children. And it kind of just gave me a sense. And I said to my sister, I cried and she bought the book for me and I just cried. And I was like, oh my goodness. And she's like, this is you. And I had no idea that it was based around children with ADHD. I wish I'd known that back then, but Mm. I I didn't know that. But that that really saved me. It really did. And it's so interesting too, because I know when we were first talking, I was, I think I was sharing with you that um, when you told me that your your uh, online Facebook group uh, called Indigo based on yeah, the, yeah. the, the uh, Indigo child and the, what I've seen from uh, the, the, like the Indigo children is always seemed very like woo woo to me. And I shared it to you that like I, I was a little bit like, oh, dear, uh, when I hear like the, the woo woo. But like, I think that the value, like e- even if right, even if that's like really out there, you heard yeah, yeah. a story 
and stories of things that you can relate to. And you're like, oh my gosh, like, it's not just me. There's like here I'm seeing on, on the page, people who are experiencing the world like I am. And that had to be so powerful. It was, it really was. And I think, I think that really then made me kind of come to terms with my OCD and my anxiety in a, in a way, a manner. And, and then I start, and then I kind of accepted help. So I think that was just kind of the, you know, I'm not, I'm not shamed anymore. And even though I didn't show everybody that it, it kind of, my sister was kind of like my escape route. She was a person that kind of really saw me and I will always thank her for that. Mm. Being, I know just how powerful it is to, to really be fully seen. Yeah. Um, so you're, you know, you're, when you were saying in the beginning that your sort of journey of diagnoses, you know, began way before 28. Um, I want to talk to you about sort of what you did after you actually received that original kind of OCD and anxiety um, uh, diagnosis when you were a teenager. But what I want to do is take a quick break. And then when we come back uh, from break, I um, would love to for you to share a bit about that. So we will be right back. If you're listening to this on December 1st, the registration kickoff event for ADHD Rewired's coaching and accountability groups was today. So if you meant to add your name to that interest list or if you added your name to the interest list but forgot to respond to us or never opened that email, the bad news is you missed the kickoff event. The good news is you have one more chance to join us. I've been to therapy for the past 10 years on and off. I've tried a bunch of different people. I found some really good ones, but not a single one of them has compared to the benefit of even just one week's worth of these sessions. There is such a huge difference between the the amount of support that you get from the accountability group and from the alumni group, from the adult study hall and from the happy hours and like getting to to meet new people in there and from your accountability teams and from the sessions. It's just all of those things combined, plus the homework too helps. All of those things combined just sort of create this entire universe of support for you to help you really learn and internalize new skills and ideas. I joined to get a 10 week boot camp to help me get a hold of my ADHD. But what I didn't realize was the amount of support that was available to me after the sessions and after this initial 10 weeks to continue to grow. I was really blown away. It was such a massive support network. Like at some point I realized that the cost of the actual 10 week program was really more of like your entrance into the alumni program that then was only the $40 a month. It allows me to have the support that I need after the program. I decided to join the group because I hit a low point and I knew that I needed more help than I was getting by a long shot. I had been getting medication for ADHD for years, but I had never found anybody who could kind of help me get to the root of it and give me the tools that I really needed in order to dig myself out of the same holes that I kept digging myself into. And I also knew it was important for me to find a community to support me because the sense of belonging that you get from being around other people who are all working toward the same goal with you is one of the best motivators for personal change that you can possibly find. And that was a theory at the beginning of this year, but after being in this group, I know that that's definitely true. So I didn't expect to find this sense of total understanding and family and really being seen and seeing other people. I I guess I knew that that would happen to some degree, but I didn't know it was going to be this good. If you're thinking about joining, you should do it yesterday because (laughs) you won't regret it. It's impossible. If you are on our interest list, go check your email to check out what you need to do. If you're not on our interest list, go to coachingrewire.com and click on the red button and then check your email for instructions. You'll need to watch a 30 minute pre-recorded presentation and answer some questions about it. You'll also need to send us a 45 second video telling us some stuff that we explain in the email. And then if everything checks out, we'll send you a link to RSVP for your last chance to register on Thursday, December 10th at 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 p.m. Eastern. 
2020 has been a really hard year for so many of us, and the challenges of this global pandemic will still be with us as we begin 2021. Come join ADHD Rewired's coaching and accountability groups this winter, so you'll be ready to take on 2021 with the support of our entire coaching community. And when you join our 10-week intensive coaching and accountability groups, you're going to be able to get ongoing support through our alumni membership community, both during and after the 10 weeks. If you are one of the many people who I know are listening to this right now, who have been on the fence about joining for some time, or you've actually already decided, but you haven't come to the website or responded to those emails yet. Yep. I'm talking to you. Do you think that you might feel regret next week if you hear me say that the groups are now full? You know, often in life, we have more regret for the decisions we don't make versus the ones we do. I think you know you're ready. Go to coachingrewired.com and click on the red button. All video submissions must be in no later then Tuesday at 11.59 Eastern, that's PM, 11.59 Eastern PM. But don't wait until then because depending on how many listeners, we have over 200 plus listeners who have already added their name to this season's interest list. Depending on how many of you actually register, this event may fill up really quickly. So check the website for more up-to-date information about registration. If you're new to this podcast, I'm really glad you're here. Our coaching groups fill up fast every season. This group is not for everyone. If you work well in a group setting, if you're highly motivated and able to make the commitment to yourself and to the other members of this group, then come join us. To find out if you would be a good fit for ADHD or rewire its coaching and accountability groups, go to coachingrewired.com registration is by invitation only this is likely your last chance to join ADHD Rewired's 23rd season of our award winning coaching and accountability groups winter sessions begin January 6th and it all begins at coachingrewired.com that's coaching rewired Dot com. All right, we are back with Natasha Hickling. So Natasha, when you were diagnosed in your, as a teenager with OCD uh, and, and anxiety and your sister was reading this book to you, you're telling us about, um, we were starting to, to see that like you're not the only person who's kind of wired differently and, and sort of sees the world in a, in a different way. Um, you had this this acceptance and this kind of understanding of yourself, a, a, a deeper understanding. What did you do with that? Um, so like um, a lot of the doctors, they wanted to put me on like antidepressants and things like that. And my mum wasn't, so I actually went to the doctor without my mum knowing. I went and kind of got a diagnosis without a knowing. And then the doctor like referred me, you know, and I actually had CBT therapy and I was very, very like, no, I don't want to do this. So, you know, so cognitive behavioral we, therapy. Yeah. Yeah. And then I had counseling, but I, they offered me it at school, but I didn't want my school to have anything to do with it. So okay. I, um, I didn't want other people to know. And I, and I know that's, that's quite a, you know, but I just didn't want people to know like at school, nobody knew nobody. Let, let me ask you this. So you went without your mom knowing it was on your sister's sort of a um, encouragement to, to seek out this diagnosis. Did your sister kind of think that if uh, parents knew that they would not be in support of this? Um, no, I don't think so. I think because she knew that I didn't, I, I think she knew that I needed to do it for myself. I think she was kind of like, you know, go and do this. And if you need help, we are here. Because my parents are, you know, they're obviously not exposed to this sort of thing. But they're so understanding after you sit down and talk to them about it. But I just feel like she needed, like I needed to take this step for myself to kind of just be like, 
you know, it's something else you need help because I'm, we, my family are not very good with asking for help. Oh, I don't know if that's a me thing or, but my family, my whole family is the same. We don't like asking for help. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's fairly common. I believe, uh, in the work that I do, it's asking for help is a, uh, is really, you know, it's, it's really a challenge for a lot of people. I mean, I was, yeah, even, it, it is, yeah. I, I was just, uh, Natasha, I was recently, yeah, just talking to my own, uh, therapist and sort of talking about how, like, one of the things that I've been learning about myself is that, well, I have, I don't have any problem asking for help. What drives me crazy is that when someone tries to help me and I haven't asked for the help. Oh, yeah, that also drives me crazy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and she, like, what are you doing? <laughs> and, she, and then she kind of reflected back to me. She's like, it's interesting how animated you just got, like, a, a around, uh, like, <laughs> wow, you really don't want help imposed on you. I'm like, it's, you know, I, I am yeah. not, I don't wait l- long to ask for help. I know when I need help. I'm, I'm, I have mm-hmm. no problem with that. But like, I think it's so disempowering when someone yeah, sort of yeah, steps yeah. in and be like, oh, I see you're struggling. Like, I'm going to help you now. It's like, wait, wait yeah, what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which I think for a lot of people is probably where that sort of reluctance to ask for help maybe comes from. Yeah. And also like for me, because I wanted to hide it, I felt like I don't think anyone would have realized that what was going on unless you were really close to me. And that's kind of why I did that. So what, what was the, uh, what was the CBT like for you? Um, it was hard because like, you know, it, it kind of puts you, you've got to kind of not attack it, but like, it's like facing is, isn't it? But you know, you're going full in and I found it really difficult. And I, you know, at the point where, so like we'd have to turn the light on and off like three times and then like two times, and then you'd have to talk about your feelings and all that. And it, it was hard. Like I always said that I wouldn't do it again. And I, it was, you know, it was shaking and my panic and things like that. But if it wasn't for that, then, I mean, I liked my counseling and my therapist, but that was more about my, you know, feelings and my anxiety and and myself. The CBT really helped me with my OCD. And I, even though it was so difficult, it was. And what you were doing sounds like it was exposure based therapy um, where where you sort of intentionally expose yourself to the things that, that make you highly anxious in order to sort of rewire the pathways in your brain so you you learn to respond differently. Um, And for for listeners who who, uh, do have uh, um, either diagnosed OCD or wondering if they have OCD um, exposure and response prevention is a uh, evidence-based CBT based uh, therapy that, that uses a sort of a graduated approach, starting with the things that are like triggering, but not like like the hardest thing and with yeah, a yeah. therapist's help kind of help you to re-regulate yourself exposing yourself to the thing without having to do all the rituals uh that that you know you have convinced yourself that is going to be the thing that helps when it's not because it helps in that moment except that the cycle continues forever and ever and it just wants more so uh just for listeners who uh, i wanted to, to kind of share what that is about uh because it is it is a very effective and as natasha uh, said is a very hard type of therapy yeah, it is, but, yeah. but it works yeah, yeah it does but it's like you're facing it head on but i actually think that's helped me a lot in my life because then uh you know like with other things that have come up later on I, i'm a trier i always say i'll try nice and i think that's what's helped me and given me that drive later on in life so even though it was difficult at the time it has helped me like the skills I still use today. So, and then you said that, that there was also counseling. Did I get that yeah, right? And so, that's different from the CBT component. Yeah. Yeah. So it was more of like therapy, sitting down and talking. Um, and I, and I, I liked to that, but the CBT therapy for, I think the counseling was better for myself for my self growth and my anxiety, but the CBT therapy was much better for my OCD. Then, um, a little bit later, you uh, was around twenty one years old. You uh, you got some uh, more more diagnosis to add to the uh, to the list. Yeah, I did. Yeah. So why don't you talk a little bit about that? Um, so kind of, um, I so after kind of all that, uh, all this stuff with my like my mental health, it took about two years to kind of get out the habit of the things and feeling like myself. And then it was kind of, oh my goodness, I was sixteen. Now it's even harder exams. And I was, I was panicking and I have a, a like a talent and a real interest in musical theater. 
But I thought, hmm. oh, well, why not go and do a vocational course? You know, and I, I don't want to say it's easier, but in my opinion, it was kind of like it's more practical and less written. Probably better suited for you. Yeah, yeah. And it was it was kind of drama was one place where you can be yourself because you can be different characters. Kind nice. of. So um, I did that and then it got me to uni. I went uni and did musical theatre again. I, I love how non-Americans use the word uni. It's just so fun. It just sounds like a cute pet, like university. It's like, I go to uni. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I really pre- like it. It's, it's, this is probably a very like ethno-American like statement, but I love like y- like British and English and Australian accents. Like it, my, my brain, it, it's like, it's like words become like candy to my brain and I love it. So I just, I, I just needed to share this. So thank you. No, it's a great <laughs> word. Uni. No one calls it university in England. <laughs> well, not people like me, really. So I, <laughs> so I went to uni and then it got more academic and then it started to all come up again. And, um, I just, my, it was actually my university tutor. She said to me like, she just said to me, like, I don't mean to be rude, but what's going on with you writing? How did you get into uni? And I was like, oh, thank you. And she was just like, look, I'm not being funny, but you're not going to pass. And I was like, oh, oh wow. my goodness. And I was literally like shaking. And I was like, but my practical is fine. And she was like, your practical was fine. But she said to me, you know, it's your academics. It's, it's not up to, you know, get the grades. And then I really started to panic because my parents weren't there, you know, to help me with things like that. My sister wasn't there, even though she did help me with my essays, but she wasn't there. And I really started to panic. So I decided to go to a clinical, I really like my uni. So I decided to go to a clinical psychiatrist and I was diagnosed with severe dyslexia and dyspraxia. And he said to me, how have you got to uni? <laughs> I, I mean, I, when I hear that people who are diagnosed later in life, like later in life with dyslexia and dyspraxia, I find like, you know, ADHD is a, is a diagnosis that is, that makes sense in a lot of ways, especially if you're not hyperactive or impulsive that can go sort of under the radar. But to get to that level of schooling without that being like identified, school must have been so hard. It was, it was really hard, but I think she, he said to me, I think what's got you through is, is that you went and did a, you knew who you were at 16 and kind of went and did a vocational course. So like I put my hand. Ooh, N- Natasha, me. hold on. You say there's some, there's some intermittent bandwidth uh, issues. So hey, my internet. Yeah. Um, if you can re uh, just repeat what you were just saying. I got support. Oh no, what was it? Sorry. I know that's why I try to put the hand up quickly. Um, so I'll, we'll, we'll leave this part into the, in the podcast. So what we typically do right before we hit record is I, I will tell my guest that um, if there's any internet weirdness, I'll put my hand by the camera as like a, to, to cue to pause. And I try to do that to have them restate what they said. And I try to do it as quickly as possible because one of the hardest questions to ask somebody with ADHD is, can you repeat what you just said? Yeah, it literally is. And um, and this is turning out to be a hard question because neither Natasha or myself can remember what <laughs> she just said. So we're gonna what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this ADHD moment to take a break, and when we uh, when we come back, we'll figure out we'll get our footing back and figure out where we left off, um, and we'll uh, we'll continue with uh, this story. So we will be right back. Did you know that listeners like you can support this podcast by becoming a patron? Just go to ADHDrewired.com and click on the Patreon tab at the top of the page. I'd like to thank Chris R. for becoming a patron last week at the $5 a month level and Samantha G. and Matt L., who both became patrons at a $10 a month level, and Susan C., who became a $25 a month patron last week. So thank you to all of our new and longtime patrons who help me and help me support my team. Whatever you can give, I appreciate it. And when you support ADHD Rewired on Patreon, you get cool perks starting at just $5 a month. All our $25 a month patrons can join me for a group coaching call on 
Tuesday, December 22nd at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. We do these every fourth Tuesday of the month at that same time. And if you can give just $10 a month, you can have access to the recordings of the Patreon coaching calls, plus a bunch of other content. And perks start at $5 a month. And would you pay $5 a month for ad-free episodes of ADHD Rewired? If so, there is a poll on my Patreon page at ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. Go vote. You can vote until the end of the year. If you find value in this podcast, in the community, in everything else that we do, and you're able to become a patron, all of your support is appreciated. To become a patron, go to ADHDrewire.com and click on the Patreon tab at the top of the page. Or just go to ADHDrewire.com slash Patreon. And thanks. If you are new to ADHD Rewired, welcome. I want to let you know about our other podcast we have here on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. If you are looking for a quick, 15 minute podcast full of tips, dry humor, and a few dad jokes. Check out Hacking Your ADHD with Will Curb. And for conversations like these with a focus on kids, check out ADHD Essentials with Brendan Mahan. And coming in 2021, be on the lookout for ADHD Diversified with MJ Siemens and the ADHD Friendly Lifestyle with Moira Maben. Come join me and our growing podcast family for the last live Q&A of 2020. We're doing it on Tuesday, December 8th at 10.30 a.m. Pacific, 1.30 p.m. Eastern. We do these every second Tuesday of the month. To register for our live Q&A, go to ADHDrewire.com and click on the events tab at the top of the page. And to everyone who has applied for our Facebook group in the last two months or so, it may be a little longer than that, we have not forgotten about you. We appreciate your patience as we process all of the applications. We are just behind on stuff, and we've had some quarantine going on here at ADHD Rewired. So, uh, yeah, we're just behind, and we will get to you. Uh, We tend to be behind on these, but we always do catch up. So hang in there. If you want to join our secret Facebook community, it will be worth the wait. Go to ADHDrewired.com slash community. That's ADHDrewired.com slash community to apply. And my commitment to you is we will get all of you in there who have already applied before the end of the year. All right, we are back and we racked our brains and short of going back to listen to the audio to find out what was just said, which we didn't do. Um, I think we're going to just di- like jump into, okay, so you were figuring out you had dyslexia. It was hard. Um, how, so what did you do with that information? Um, so with the information, I actually got a lot of support, a lot more than I ever had done in school. And, um, I got like, uh, like in Britain, it's it, when you get diagnosed with dyslexia, you get like all these like free softwares for your laptop and you get a tutor and you get all these different things. And like, if it wasn't for my tutor, like I literally would not have made it and got my dissertation. I still don't know how I wrote my dissertation, but I did. And it was really down to him that what I still found after everything I got for it, there were still so many questions. Mm. Like, why do I do this? Is not dyslexia. This is not dyspraxia. Would you be able to kind of just briefly share what is dyslexia and dyspraxia? Because I think that, um, well, with dyslexia, I think most people think that it's just that you reverse your D's and B's, P's and Q's, but it's, it is so much more than that. So how does it show up for you? Um, so with my dyslexia, my uh, understanding, so when I'm reading my comprehension, I can't read and then, then get it into my brain to understand it in my kind of world. And then like read it out again. So I, 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 I find, um, reading like really hard to then understand, to comprehend. My working memory is, um, I really struggle with that. Um, my pronunciation, 
with like hard words that I, I don't understand. Also, like words and text can't stick into my brain. Also, um, when I'm writing, um, like if someone's talking at me, I can't then process the information, then write it. Yep. I, uh, I, I've never received an official dyslexia diagnosis, but I'm fairly certain that if I got evaluated for that, I, I would certainly meet that criteria. Yeah. I think a lot of people do, but it's just, you know, it's just if it, it affects you, like your life and, and how it gets in the way. And what about dyspraxia? Um, dyspraxia is really uh, your coordination. Um, so like the big sign was I couldn't, it, still at 21, I couldn't ride a bike. Um, and like dance routines, I would get my left from my right and my right from my left. And also with balance, um, I could not balance. I was so clumsy. And I think that was a real big thing for me more than my, because it was like, it's more of a physical, you know, in a kind of a way. Kind of like where, where your body ends and the rest of the world begins. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's some, some related relatability there as well. Um, I mean, it's funny too. When I was in, when I was in high school, um, I, I was on the football team for a couple of years. Um, I didn't, I was not good. Like, and what I realized is that like, I could not conceptualize the place and where I kind of actually fit into it. It was, yeah, it was so yeah. bad. Like, I mean, and, <laughs> and I look back on that now, I'm like, oh my gosh. Like, I mean, it was great because it made me very physically active. I was probably in the best shape of my life. But like the, the reason I never played because I didn't know what was going on in the game and like I didn't understand yeah, what I was yeah, supposed yeah. to be doing, um, which is yeah, and same thing with wrestling. I wrestled for a couple of years after I, uh, from like middle school to my freshman year of, of uh, oh, high school no. until I got really badly injured. Um, and I was like, well, that sucks. I'm not doing that anymore. Uh, <laughs> and, but I couldn't conceptualize where my body needed to go. Right? Yeah, and exactly, it, it, it's, yeah. so, it's so interesting to, to like, oh, this is also a thing. Yeah, it is a big thing. That's why I stick to solo sports like running because it doesn't involve anybody else. You're just running on a straight road and that's it. If it, if it you know, if it comes to counting and running or looking at your watch, I can't do that. But if you're just running, then you're fine. So before you ran your uh, your a marathon in your apartment, did you like lock up all your valuables and, and fragiles? What? The things, the things that, that could break as you're running? Yeah, I did do that. And then we moved like all the furniture out of the way and stuff like that. And then one time the cat, I have a cat and dog um, that I got bought from China and they, they like the, the cat that like, came in front of me and I was like, no, because I was so worried. I was just going to like topple over. <laughs> well, it's a good thing that uh, the cat had some uh, cat like reflexes. Yeah, that is a one good thing. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So you were, so you did, you did complete school you're, you're yeah, I did, yeah okay um so what what were some of the strategies that you found helpful that helped you get through uh your your undergrad so I actually um it was my postgrad so I became a mm. teacher and I did a, an extra year and that's where I, I found a lot of things and um, so I became to be a teacher primary school teacher and a lot of the stuff I do in my classroom I actually do with myself so a lot of the things that I teach with my kids because I get it I then do at home. So, you know, things like, you know, like if like a timeout, I know it's really silly, but I would like give myself a timeout and like, you know, I would, if like I had some kids that were dyslexic and I, and they were, I would write on the board and then I would write, you know, down here. And if like I had to go for a meeting or, you know, I would ask for the PowerPoint beforehand, or if I had to do some reading, like a script, or if I had to read to my class, I would read beforehand. So then I'm prepared mm. with the academic words and things like that. But that's what I did a lot with my children. I used to teach them about things like that, about being prepared and, you know, timers and things like that. So it actually not only helped myself, but it helped my kids. So you said that sometimes you give yourself a timeout. Yes. What What's the uh, impetus for giving yourself a time out and what do you do for that? Uh, so I am, um, I'm really bad with like ruminating, um, like getting a negative thought and then spiraling out and my emotions then become, I don't like to admit it, but anger. Uh, so I used to just, I kind of, I didn't know when I was like that, but I used to just go to a space. Now I'm, you know, with my coach, I'm learning about pausing the, you know, the power of the pause and things power like that. Pause, yes. And it's, but it's all the same, like in, in my opinion, you know, the time out, but, with the time out, I couldn't do it in the moment. But now I'm a bit more self-aware. I'm, I'm learning to do it in the moment. But back then, it was kind of just like I needed things to 
help me. So when I could feel my anger, I would have a place to go. And it was just like that place to just like kind of calm down by myself without letting it out. That didn't always work. So when you're in this sort of like cycle of rumination and you and you recognize it, what 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 specifically will you do to kind of help yourself through that? And um, back then, um, it was I, it, it's it's not the best method, but it was the method that I that I could do then. So I I bought a punching bag when I was a teenager. So then I would go and do, uh, do it on the punching bag rather than at the wall. Um, I'm sure your parents thought, appreciated that. Yeah, especially when I when I broke the glass on my front door. So that was the bit where it was. <laughs> I know my parents laugh about it. I had a crack for it for years. Um, so we so then we bought a punching bag and things like that. But then when I got older, it was kind of like going to your room and then like you know you like a cushion. And then just kind of hold the cushion and kind of look a bit like a fidget toy and kind of just like push it in and out because I wasn't very good at meditation and breathing back then. So I used to do, I used to do that and then that would calm my breathing down and it would calm my mind down because it would give me something to concentrate on. Mm. What, what do you do now for self-soothing? Um, I actually, my, my coach gave me the challenge of, of trying meditation. And because I'm a trier, I'm, I'm really trying. I can do three minutes. That's really good for me. That's, and I'll tell you what, Natasha, there is research that supports that even one minute a day can actually have benefit. Um, it can oh, actually wow. change the, the physiological structures of our brain um, uh, just through one minute of focusing on our breath. Oh, wow. Well, that's great to know. So I'm doing okay if I've got three minutes. <laughs> yeah, three minutes. I mean, you're like overachieving here. I mean, it's... Uh, <laughs> No, and, and something too that, that has helped because I'm, a, um, like, I am someone who is an extremely inconsistent meditator. Um, where, like, I'll, I'll, I just have on again and off again practices. And I, oh. and, um, like, I, I typically will re- resume my practice of meditation when I'm, like, in a period of just, like, higher than usual stress in my life. Yeah, what I yeah, wish yeah. I could do is, like, maintain it while actually, while things are actually pretty good because, when I have been able to do that, like it's, I just find it so helpful just for other ADHD related uh, sort of symptoms. But one of the things that I've found as an inconsistent meditator, because I suspect that people listening to this may also be inconsistent meditators if yeah. they've meditated. And so if you've gotten to a place where you're like, okay, I can, I can now meditate for 10 minutes or I can now meditate for 20 minutes and you're doing it for a while. And then the ADHD wins and you start meditating and all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, it's been like three months since I've last meditated. Don't try to resume where you left off. Start yeah, back yeah, start at like at one minute. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, it's going to be so frustrating. I can imagine like 30 minutes. No. And then you just put it off and off and off and off. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so a uh, one minute, like even just one deep breath. He's better yeah, than nothing, yeah. which I mean, we all have time for, we can, we can do that right now. We can just take one deep breath. Isn't it amazing how good that feels and how easy it actually is to do? Yeah. Cause you can have it anywhere. And that's what I'm trying to learn, but I'm not at that point where I can just, I'm just trying to regulate it. And then it hopefully it will come natural. So it's something we can do from anywhere. Like connecting in an online community, which is um, a part of what you have been recently doing is creating an online community on, on Facebook. Um, sort of in the, the spirit of uh, where you first felt understood uh, through uh, Indigo, uh, this book, uh, Indigo, right? So do you want to just talk a little bit about that? And I, and I hope as we are sort of wrapping up in the last probably five minutes of this conversation that the landscapers who I just saw outside aren't going to go right past the window. So with that, tell us a little bit about your, your online community. Yeah, so I um so kind of I actually left China in um in December and I moved to Malaysia and I wanted to kind of even though I was diagnosed in China but I I kind of put it off and put it off and put it off I didn't really want to think about it until I kind of was out and then I left China and I came to Malaysia and I there was not really much support here like I have my online therapist and. Um, I just started coaching, which I absolutely love. It's it's literally like one of the best things I've ever done. Mm. And um, I just, I wanted people to talk to because like 
um, I just felt like I, my, my parents and my partner, Ben is absolutely fantastic, but they just don't get it. And like, I felt like that's why I was, but when I was a teacher, I could relate to those children. So I, cause you can say, I get it. Cause I, you know, I've been through it and I, I wanted the same sort of people. Um, and I, but obviously because obviously the pandemic and obviously being in Asia, it's still not yet developed, you know, the SEM world kind of, it's not quite there yet. Um, there's nothing here really. So I just wanted to kind of create a, like a, just a small group that just met on zoom weekly. And it's just, there's, you know, we're just everyday people and we just, we just come on and we just talk about how the week's been and, you know, and if people can give strategies that help other people, then that's great. That's awesome. And so what have you been finding um, or what is, what's been surprising for you about um, be organizing something like this? Um, well, I, I found that it actually had like a real, like a nice bit. I didn't think that anyone, you know, at first I was like, you know, I would just do it for myself and, you know, and then actually people started to respond to it. And I was, you know, because of my quarantine kind of, um, you know, I, I started to post videos and then people were like, wow, like you could do this and, you know, it kind of opened a door. Um, but, but what the, the, the funny thing and the thing I love about it is when somebody's talking, every, all you can see, it's like nodding dogs. Everybody's <laughs> yes. just like, yes, yep. yes, mm-hmm. yes. And it's kind of like just that, oh my goodness, there is other people out there that have the same thing as me. And it's kind of like the indigo child, you know, like, when at that moment in my life where it was like, oh my goodness, there's other people there like me, you know, and obviously I didn't know who these people were then. And it's kind of like that in this group. And I, and it, and it's just, I just absolutely love it. It's just amazing. And you know, then there, there is a difference too from uh, between reading and, and even dialoguing in a, like an online forum with other people. Then yeah. there is between that and actually, as you described, like seeing people and be nodding on screen. And this is why, uh, you know, I, my model of coaching is group coaching because to be yeah. able to have gr- a group of people coming together and everyone's like, oh my gosh, you have like, I could have said those exact same words. And I thought I was the only one that experienced life this way. Um, yeah. there it's, you know, it's, it's so powerful. And what's interesting is when we realize that when we're in this community of people with ADHD who are, you know, supporting each other and working with each other, um, and relating to each other, there's this really interesting thing that happens. We realize that our, our problems, our challenges aren't actually that unique. And then we yeah. can, you know, we can sort of, I don't say get over ourselves, but sort of like, okay, they're not that unique. All right. What can I do about them now? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It gives you that, like, I felt like since, like, well, since being here, uh, it's kind of the acceptance to kind of begin your journey almost like begin it, not again, but like kind of now you know what it is and people have these different things, you know, it's kind of giving yourself that acknowledgement, like, you know, there's other people going on, you know, what, how can you learn? That's what I love about learning from people. Mm. You know, yeah, I, I don't think there's anything more to be said about about that. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like if you've never if you've never had the opportunity to experience being with other people with ADHD, and, and you know, and one thing I would, would say too, and I think it's wonderful that you're providing this uh, um, uh, as a resource online. Um, you know, there are I know that there are spaces in, in, in various online communities that all it basically is is a complaining fest. Right. Yeah. And, and yeah. I don't find that to be helpful. So like so like if whether it's an online community or when we are all able to eventually, you know, see each other in person again, like if you are finding that space to just be a bunch of people complaining, it's not the right group. Yeah. So. Yeah. I find that. And like, I, you know, I kind of think, you know, like especially with posting, you know, like on the group, we just post about the meetings. And that's it really like, I, you know, and if people have resources, that's great. But the complaining thing, it is, you know, people do need to complain, but I find I'm quite a positive person. So I like to put a positive spin on mm. it. And that's what I found because I'm like that. And I, but I feel like a lot of people that have kind of come into the group are also got a similar state of mind and they just want, they just want to talk to people. That's that. Yeah. And that's, that's why we're, we're all here right now too. We, we just, we want to know that we're not alone and we can learn from each other and, and, uh, support each other. 
Exactly. Natasha Hickling, thank you so much for sharing your journey with us. Is there um, any information that you want to leave uh, our listeners with? Um, just, you know, th- just be yourself. And I know that's a hard thing to say, but because like I wasn't, <laughs> I was myself, but I was two different people. Just be true to yourself. And I, I think that until you've got that perspective where you kind of understand yourself, then that's the only way to move forward. That's Well, that's my opinion. Well, Natasha, thank you for sharing uh, your story. And uh, we hope that this was helpful uh, to you as, as a listener. So uh, we will catch you next week. Thank you. This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find summaries and additional resources for each episode. You can apply to our free and secret Facebook community. You can learn more about ADHD Rewired's intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups and sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content you won't get anywhere else. It's all at ADHDrewired.com. While you're there, click the Patreon button. If you're a regular listener and you're still listening to my voice, consider making a monthly contribution by becoming a patron through our Patreon page. If you are able to financially support my work, it would mean a lot. This show is free to listeners, but it is not free to produce. And patrons get really cool perks. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tibbers. You can like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ADHD Rewired. If you're a coach, therapist, or related professional, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash Eric Tibbers. You can also subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube and you can subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube and see select interviews and some other videos I've posted. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends and your family and your clients, as well as your coaches, therapists, and doctors. And if you're a coach, therapist, doctor, or ADHD support group leader, and you would like a pack of podcast postcards to hand out, you can request those at my website, ADHDrewired.com. And if you're a member of Chad or any other ADHD support group, please be sure to tell them about this podcast. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. You know, you might be the person that turns somebody on to a podcast for the very first time. And if you really love this episode, please consider hitting share on your podcast player. I'm only one person and I count on you to help me spread the message. One of the biggest things that you can do to support this podcast and to help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts, on Stitcher, or any other podcast app that accepts ratings and reviews. And don't forget to hit subscribe on this podcast on your podcast app so new episodes are automatically pushed to your favorite podcast app. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Not sure where to start? In no particular order. Check out Atomic Habits by James Clear. The Body Keeps Score by Bessel van der Kolk. 10% Happier, and Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics. These are both by Dan Harris. Change Your Questions and Change Your Life by Marilee G. Adams. The One Thing by Gary Keller and Jay Papasan. Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Vaden. The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. Do you have trouble asking for help? Listen to The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. It's one of the best produced audiobooks I've ever heard. If you're looking for something a little bit more say magical i unexpectedly fell in love with the harry potter series and i don't usually listen to those kinds of books and i loved it and of course if you haven't yet boarded the Brene brown bus yet check out Brene brown's books starting with the gifts of imperfection daring greatly rising strong the power of vulnerability and if you're an entrepreneur or a leader in any capacity check out her 2018 book dare to lead and Brene still is my most wanted guest so if you know Brene you would be so kind to make that connection for me I would be really really grateful you know who else I would like to have on the show you 
podcast tab at ADHDrewired.com and then click the Be a Guest button at the top of that page and schedule a 15-minute pre-interview. This is Eric Tibbers reminding you to keep learning, keep growing, and keep connecting. Self-care is not selfish, and no matter what gets done or doesn't get done, at the end of the day, you are still enough. And no matter how hard it feels, we can do hard things. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.